today's topic is the current state of American football as we know it. And I think um, on this uh, Swarm and Shoot football show, it's um, interesting for us as coaches to be dealing with a few things uh, regarding the pandemic. And I know we've done some uh, creative things along the way to help us out, but uh, you, I believe you've got to put yourself in a situation where you take a look at history, look at some things over time, and see just how that may um, affect you in the future. But let me give you an introduction an article I read uh, the other day by uh, Chantel Jennings uh, from uh, the website The Athletic. All right? And um, the topic of the article that she wrote is A Season of Influenza and Influence, How World War I and a Pandemic in 1918 changed college football forever. You know, it's interesting, 1918, you know, I know uh, the other day my wife and I were watching uh, Downton Abbey, which is a, a PBS masterpiece theater, and, and, and it was, that was during this time. And uh, it was interesting, they were talking about a few things um, with the Spanish flu and so forth. And I thought it, I thought it was, you know, pretty enlightening and and then I went and did some research and then this article shows up let, let me give you uh, let me rewind things about a hundred years ago uh, 100 years ago as World War one was coming to a close during the fall of 1918 a flu pandemic hit the world seemingly overnight in a span of a few months the flu infected one-third of the world's population and killed an estimated 50 million people. In the United States, it seemed as though a new enemy had hit its own borders as public anxiety shifted from the fear of death through war to the fear of death through influenza. Yet against this bleak backdrop, a college football season not only persisted in the United States, but also worked to spread the game in a way that changed it forever. As top college athletes enlisted in the war efforts and universities struggled to find enough bodies to field teams, more players who otherwise wouldn't have had the opportunity to play at the college level were given a chance to participate. The sport became less of an elitist pastime and more of an every man's game. College football became seen as more American as military training camps put together teams to face off against themselves and universities. And when the flu ultimately passed and congregating was again allowed around the country, the communal feel of a football game proved valuable. When Walter Camp sat down to write his review of the 1918 football season for Spalding's official football guide, he summarized the season like this. The football season of 1918 was one of the most peculiar in the whole history of the game, and yet it will stand as an epic-making one in the progress of the sport. By the end of this strange season... The two teams that split the national championship, Fielding Yost's Michigan group and Pop Warner's Pitt team, had played just five games apiece. And with only one played before November because of war and the, and the flu. I think 1918 is a season that a lot of people have forgotten about. But if you put it within a slightly broader context... It's that the war effectively helps transform the game of college football. Sports historian S.W. Pope said it becomes a national sport. Now, that, that's an excerpt from this wonderful article here. And, you know, you look today and you start to notice a few things to how everything is being perceived right now. And, uh, you know, I start to look at, here's a headline for you, college sports bleak financial future in the wake of coronavirus pandemic apparent in AD survey. Now, this particular article here is, in, is uh, from CBS Sports, and I found it online. And it's, it's interesting to see 
just where athletic directors, these power brokers up there in the Power Five group and the big uh, universities are out there, and they're taking a look at how this is going to affect everything. And I think it's, um, you know, the, the point being made here, all of this hints at a possible future that includes cutting sports, slashing salaries, laying off staff, and weighing ability to fully fund existing sports if the finances become too tight. I, I think when you look at this, there, there's quite a bit to it, but that's one particular article that I found. Another one here, um, you know, about the coronavirus, y- you hit this one and it just sort of just, I don't know, it's, it's just interesting the way it's going. It says here, we're all effed. There's no other way to look at this, is there? Administrators and insiders weigh in as the coronavirus threatens the college football season and explain why the entire NCAA system could hang in the balance. And that is what is really intriguing to me because you're talking about the entire NCAA system. And when you think of it that way, here we are at uh, Defiance College, Division Three football, Heartland Conference, and there are more Division Three football programs than there are any other level. Um, there's a lot of colleges playing Division Three football. Yet, in many ways, we are waiting to see where a lot of these uh, major universities are deciding the outcome of where football is going to be and other sports, as you've seen in in these articles that I'm mentioning here. You know, I believe that we have a tremendous opportunity here at Defiance College. And um, even though we're sitting waiting, just like everybody else is waiting, what I've uh, been fortunate enough to do is I've talked to some of these guys that I know that are athletic directors at these power five schools, um, people that are the influencers, the, the people out there that are saying that they are waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, we probably won't know a lot about this in particular, but there are a few items on the agenda because everybody is is working out contingency plans. So when we find out about a variety of things, I, I know that it was interesting. The, the thing that really kicked this thing off about three or four weeks ago was Kirk Herbstreet basically saying, look, we're probably not going to be playing football. Uh, and, and that started it all off and he based it on when um, we would have some type of, of um, way to deal with this on a on a broad perspective on on basically you know what is it that we've got to take uh, what will our medical uh, field have ready for us uh, be it a shot of some sort an a- a- antibiotic which probably isn't the case because it's a virus but there's all different type of thing our researchers are looking for things out there that um, you know, and then and then to mass produce it, and he's saying, well, based on that, a vaccine isn't going to be ready to be able to play the game. So Kirk hit it off, and then there was all types of on each side of of this saying, oh, we're going to play right now. We've got all types of different opinions out there and so forth. But really, what I want to discuss right now for you, and at least just to put it in your mind, is when are we going to play? Um, why is it important that we play and how this affects um, the major colleges and trickles down to small college level. And so if you look at it with all this pandemic, you know, the, the landscape today says that we don't know when. What I keep hearing is that sometime end of May, early June, there will be meetings that basically set um you know, basically set the table for what it is we're going to be heading into next. And and that that is, you know, what's interesting to me. So how does this bleak financial outlook that you're t- talking about here affect us? And what's the trickle-down effect to our level as you start to look at it? And you, you look at some things right now at the bigger levels, you have, you know, we, we did cancel March Madness and that 
also trickles down because a percentage of the funds go down to the Division three level. So this is an NCAA system that uh, there is revenue uh, that exists of that. Now, the financial outlook is significant at that level. You know, you've got it to the point right now where I thought it was very interesting that you start to look at some things here. Like here's a graphic here, a 2017-18 LSU athletics budget. And what does that mean for us? Well, it could mean quite a lot. Um, because if you start to look at this screen here that I have, and and I'll for people just listening on 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 our podcast player, I'll describe this to you. It's uh, basically a revenue by sport at a major university, in this case, LSU. And when you look at this, you see like LSU football, their net gain or loss is is what they're, they're taking every sport they've got there. And you took it, take a look at football. It's $55 million gain. All right. The next biggest sport there is uh, basketball, men's basketball. And you've got in that case, well, you've got two more, two other sports that are making money. Men's basketball, 292000 and even making more than that at LSU, which is very uncommon at this level, is baseball. Um, they make $345,000. So 345000 292000 for men's basketball. And then you got football making $55 million. This, this is I've spoken to... Um, couple friends of mine, one, one particular that was a Big 12 athletic director, and said, this is not uncommon. Um, everything is driven by football at that level. And when that happens, you have to start looking. You, here, here is at LSU the losses made by some of the other sports. So everybody has an idea. Women's basketball, $4.2 million loss. Um, you know, you've got a golf program losing 892000 in the men, 735000 in the women. You've got a gymnastics program there, $2.4 million loss. Soccer, $1.6 million loss. Softball, $2.6 million loss. And this goes on and on. Track and field, if you take a look at men's and women's track and field, Right there, there's over four million, well, actually over five million dollars of loss between those two sports. So all these sports are losing a tremendous amount of money at these major colleges. And what has come up, as I've I've spoken to um, a couple of these power brokers that, that they're called today, is you've got a situation right now that we've lost money because of March Madness. Departments all over the country um, are changing as many ways as they can. They're adjusting their budgetary outlooks and so forth. But the very, I guess the, the scary part for some of this is I have heard and seen where athletic directors are looking at this. If, they, if we don't play college football at that level in the, in the 2020 academic year, this season, then – they're basically putting ourselves in a situation. We're putting ourselves in a situation where a lot of these sports will not exist at major college and at that level, at the Division One level that we're talking about here. They're talking about dropping sports that are considered non-revenue. And they're also talking about decreasing the sheer number of sports that is required by Division I athletic departments. So what that means is, let's say they dis- it's decided, look, all we want to do is keep Title IX in place between men and women opportunities. Then what's going to happen is, and this is a quote from th- that I've been hearing out there, is you've got football, which is going to make the revenue. You've got men's basketball, which is which at some schools makes a little more, a little less, but uh, can make money. And then there might be an outlier sport that they may keep. And then from there, you're going to keep some female sports and you're going to drop a whole lot of men's sports. And so you can decrease everything because it is a, a budgetary 
uh, issue where you're you're running this as a business, and that's what's happening right now. There, those those types of discussions are being had. What if we don't play college football? What if we don't? We they already know that the revenue may be changed from them. There's also a talk of if we play college football, where a lot of people will love to see this um, of increasing the number of teams in the college football playoff because. That would increase the revenue. You could go to eight teams, 16 teams down the road. And if that is negotiated and it's set up, because that's what the major networks want. It's just some of the presidents uh, in the past have not wanted that because the sheer revenue, from what I have heard, um, if you take football and you just take it to 16 teams, the revenue it would produce in a playoff capacity, let alone what you could do with 32, as Mike Leach likes, 64 teams. You know, if you do that, he goes, it would eclipse March Madness and make it look like a high school um, state championship. That's how much revenue they're sitting out there. So I think right now this stuff's on the table. So we'll see where this goes. But as you look at it, it is intriguing where this may go. So, um, you know, th- that's the major college level. Now, as far as us and where we're, what we're dealing with here is um, Division Three is a tuition revenue based model. Uh, we don't have athletic scholarships. We only give a- academic scholarships and the like, and some participation scholarships for different um, non-athlete uh, related um, uh, things that, that, that people are dealing with. You know, like like could be going. You know, we 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 can give scholarships in areas like music and so forth, but uh, but it's not going to happen in football or or any other sport. Now, what what's interesting is that. This Division Three model, with it being tuition revenue based, um, the opportunity that lies there uh, for us is that if the rosters can carry the load, in other words, get the an increase in roster size, um, depending on the college and where athletics lies in the total revenue piece. And um, that defines college athletics um, is a significant portion of the total student population. So um, it's it's evident that raising that level on rosters is important. So if you have an idea, we'll be heading into our third season right now. And the first year I was here, albeit, um, and I got here in August of that season, we had, um, you know, about 67, 68 uh guys on the roster. So it was a little late. We had lost uh, a bunch of um, guys in the, uh, in, in the process of uh, one coach to the next coach is how that went. So, um, you know, we had a very small roster last year. We upped it a little bit and got it uh, to 81 was our roster to start the season off. And, and on our roster size, I believe will even with the pandemic and all these things going on, will increase, um, well over a hundred, uh, could be as high as 120, somewhere in that ballpark because our retention is, has, has gotten larger each year. Um, and not only has that gotten larger, the, the roster size of recruits coming in has increased every year that we've been here. So we feel really good about that. So that's exciting for the future as we, as, as we go forward. And we've got players out there that uh, are committed to us, uh, that are all set to go, have made their deposits, are ready to come out and play. And they're all wondering, well, when are we going to play? You know, and and they all want to know. They're all training. I see guys training in their uh, garages, and they're out there, and, you know, they'll put stuff on Twitter. Here I am running routes, or here I'm doing drills and so forth, which is exciting to watch this stuff on Twitter. Now, what is interesting here, and what I want to wrap up with is what I saw an article the other day. Chris Fowler uh, is is basically saying on NBC Sports, he goes, he has there's informed speculation that the 2020 season could start in February. And that's this piece here. So on College Football Talk, they're looking at this, and he's going through it saying, you know, what is going on? And he does, and he refers to 
Kirk Herbstreet's comments that we started all this off. And there is a little bit of optimism of when we're going to start and when we're not. But at some point, you know, they're, they're talking about the whole everything with regarding the vaccine. But Chris Fowler saying, you know, there's a very good chance that the season could start in February. So we don't really know where this is going to go. If it starts in February, I would assume then you push it back and, you know, students would be coming on campus. Um, because what the reason that this is happening goes back to that power five group of athletic directors and presidents and the decisions they're making. And they're looking at this saying, look, Hey, we need a full season because the sheer revenue as as we, uh, took a look at what LSU's revenue had been and, and with all the sports, they need this just to balance the budget. If they don't, we're going to have problems. So, He's saying that because in this article, he's saying that sometime in February, the season starts. Now, I know it's going to be cold in Ohio, you know, and it's going to be different, but it would finish up. They're talking about in May or June would be the wrap up of the season, just like, um, you know, they, they would still have the full season there. Therefore, the revenue comes. And then for the 2021 season, then th- there, there's there got to be a way that they'll shift and so forth and play in the fall and so forth. So this is just some of the things that are out there. Um, I know it's a total speculation, but understand that at Defiance College, where we are in good shape in football right now, we are increasing our roster size every year. We're excited about the opportunity and where this is going to go. So um, no matter what happens, whenever we play, Right now, the Yellow Jackets will be ready to go. So I want to thank you very much for joining the show today as, uh, as we take a look at a little bit about what is going on and take a look back to uh, that 1918 Spanish flu uh, and how that affected football back then. Who knows how this is going to affect football moving forward and athletics as we know it.